Andrew McCart, IFL TV, proudly sponsored by Everlast. Now, I've got to say, I'm very, very, very delighted to be joined by the king of the journeyman himself, Peter Buckley. Um, Peter, I spoke to you before I pushed record and told you I've probably been to over 100 of your fights, man, because you fought over 300, well, 300 times. But before we talk yeah. about boxing lifestyle and everything that you've done in boxing, how's life? How's things for you right now? Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, I'm working and that, so keeping busy, so that's okay, yeah. Definitely. <clears throat> Well, that's good to hear, mate. You're, uh, well, like I said to you there, you, you had well, 300 uh, professional professional fights and stuff like that. I'll go back to the beginning because uh, I know you're, like, you, were, you were a pretty decent amateur. You, you didn't lose many amateur fights, did you? So uh, no. go back to your amateur days and talk to me. Why did you start boxing? Um, I started boxing when I was 10. My older brother done it. Uh, a load of kids off up me. The same road that I lived on when I was a kid, all done it. We went to the local boxing club, Talbot ABC. It was a new club. And uh, I just found I was quite handy at it. And um, at my first fight when I was 11, uh, I won that, got best fight of the night. And then my second fight was matched up. The kid didn't turn up. So I boxed the kid who was a lot heavier than me. He had six fights, six wins. I lost on a majority decision. And then after that, I won my next 19 fights on the trot. And I lost to uh, Nigel Wenson from Liverpool in the uh, schoolboy finals, semi-finals. And look, so I was a decent amateur. Um, I had 54 fights and I lost four. And then when I was 15, uh, I was in quite a bit of trouble in that, with the police and that when I was a kid. And I drifted out of boxing. Look, so I, I weren't around to be boxing. So um, when I was 20, a local uh, pro ran by me called Rocky Law, that was Midland Bantamweight champion, mm -hmm. introduced me back into boxing. Well, he said to me one night, I was in the pub with him having a drink. Said to me, Oh, you should come back boxing. There's me, I had a few beers. I said, Yeah, okay, yeah. Next day, he knocked my door. I was a bit shocked because I thought it was just a drink talking. And uh, Rocky was only little inside, but big in stature, you know what I mean? And uh, he said to me, Get your stuff then. I was like, What? He went, Come on, coming, you coming training? I told him, I'll be, I'm bringing you over. I went, Okay, a bit shocked. So I went over to a gym in King Stanley, it was an old pub. And just got on the pads, started going over twice, three times a week. And then that gym got, that uh, pub got closed down. So Nobby had no gym at the time. So he was taking around different gyms in Dudley and all that sparring and that. And he took me one day sparring over um, Dudley, uh, Dudley Club. And I was sparring a half decent kid there. And I was just jabbing the head off him. Nobby said to me, oh, I think it's time for you to get, you know, your medicals done and that. And I was like, a bit quick. It was about three months I've been training. And uh, got my medicals done. Next thing he said, you need a kit. So why? He said, you're boxing next week. I was like, oh, okay. And I didn't really understand the programme, so I went and boxed a kid called Alan Baldwin, my first fight over in Stafford. And I actually beat the kid up. And uh, they give it a draw. I didn't even know what a draw was. That's naive I was to be boxing then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, no, but I thought I won that. He said, yeah, but that's how it goes sometimes in the pro box. I was like, okay. So I had my second fight against uh, a man called Ronnie Stevenson. It was very experienced. He had over 60 fights and he was a man. He was 30 years of age, knew the game. And um, he actually dropped me in the third or fourth round. I took the count, got up, and I was pissed off with myself and went back to the court. And nobody's gone, no, you've done all right there. I've got to put me over. And he's gone, no, 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 you didn't panic and that, and whatever. And I lost some points to him. And then I won my next six, seven fights on the trot. I was doing okay, do you know what I mean? And uh, I was just fighting every other week, really, do you know what I mean? I want to go back to when you were 15 when you, you got in trouble. You, you did then, did you go to jail and stuff like that? I, I've been reading and stuff like that. So was it sort of like, did boxing bring you, did it sort of, was sort of the old cliche, did it save your life sort of thing when you, you came back to it at 20 years old? Were you still getting into a little bit of trouble after your teen years? Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. Look, so I, when I was 15, um, I got locked up. And the, dad, the first day I got locked up, as mad as it sounds, my dad died. My dad was only 48. My dad was working down in London at the time because I'm from an Irish family and my dad's family all lived down in London. And there weren't much work going on in Birmingham at the time, so my dad used to go down in London Monday to Friday. And then I got arrested and remanded in custody on the Friday. And I didn't get a visit over the weekend, which I found was a bit strange. And then on the Monday, I got a visit off my older sister and her husband at the time my dad had, had a heart attack and died. So I was on remand for a week. I got out then. My dad threw him up, and then I went back to court and I got four months detention centre, which was not boot camp, but yeah, back in the day. 
And it was very hard. And I, you know, I didn't like it, but I'd done, I'd done more or less the four months out of it. Got out, getting back into trouble, back in remanded in custody. And I, I just went on like that for a couple of years. I was like, I got two and a half years for violence. And then um, I got out. I got another 12. I used to, it was just a cycle. I was getting arrested all the time. All the police knew me around the area. And I was always in trouble. And I was just a bit angry with the world, do you know what I mean? And I didn't give a fuck, basically. And uh, like I say, and it is a cliche saying boxing saved me, but it really did. It really did save me. Because I was I was anything like just for being in jail for the rest of my life, basically, because I didn't I didn't really care about nothing, do you know what I mean? I cared about my family, obviously, but jail wasn't a deterrent for me, it didn't really bother me. Mm. Well, you, you mentioned there that Noddy that you said there that brought you back into boxing and stuff like that. You turned pro within three months of going back to the gym. Did you ever think in your head that you were a good amateur, you didn't lose as many fights as an amateur, that when you did turn pro, did you have aspirations to become British champion? Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to just guess here myself that you, you didn't think that you would you would have 300 pro fights and become like the journeyman that you were. and You're, you're a legend in your own right. Do you know what I mean? Did you ever think when you turned pro that you'd be this, or did you think that you were going to? Did you have aspirations to become British champion or even further? Um, it, when I first started, all it was, it was just keeping me out of trouble and earning a few quid, basically. Do you know what I mean? It was lots of to focus on. Yeah, you know, I was going over the gym three times a week and I was running every day. And I, cause my fitness has always been quite good. I was good. Like when I was a kid, I used to look, do long distance running for a club and that. And I've always been like played rugby and things like that. I've always liked physical sports and, uh, Rugby, I was a really good rugby player when I was younger. I used to play for like the year of rugby and that. And I, I played for a team, like, you know, out, out of school and that. Mm. And I had to choose between rugby and boxing because I injured my shoulder once in boxing, uh, in rugby, sorry. And that pulled out of an amateur fight. My trainer weren't happy. And he said, look, you know, you got to pick one or the other. Yeah. So I picked boxing. But look, say, um, when I first turned pro, it was just to, it was something just, I, I never, I mean, someone would have said to me, you can have 300 fights, would have looked at them like it was crazy. To have 100 fights it was some achievement, but it looks like I won two Midland titles at two different weights. And I possibly could have fought, I mean, I fought number, numerous British champions who just about beat me. And so I wouldn't have been disgraced if I would have fought for a British title, or even the European title. Looks like I fought good enough kids. I mean, I fought former British champions, former European champions, former world champions. I mean, Someone sent me a, uh, one of my fights a few weeks ago when I fox, boxed Francis Benichu, who was IBF champion and European champion. And when you watch that fight, you couldn't tell who was a champion. Who was, you know, I wasn't out of my league, you know what I mean? I wasn't just got work, just covering up. And that. I had ambition to win. Look, say, uh, I, I would have loved to have fought for a British title, but if I would have fought for a British title, the one last drew, I wouldn't have gone on to have 300 fights. That's a guaranteed fact, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but the reason, I mean, some of the stories I've read about you, I mean, so, like, the reason you had 300 fights is because you would get a phone call, like, when you were having your dinner, and you'd yeah. take a fight like that within hours of the fight happening. So, what's the craziest or the, the shortest time you've had to prepare for a fight? What's the most craziest story that you could tell us in the shortest amount of time that you've took a fight? Well, quite a few, but, like, I remember once I'd been training the one day, come home, I had my dinner, my wife had done my dinner, I'll meet my dinner. Next thing, Nobby's rang me up. He's gone, there might be a fight going. I said, when's that? He said, probably in about two hours. I went, where? He said, Dudley. Well, Dudley ain't that far from me. And he went, bro, I'll ring you back. He said, because he had someone fighting the kid and the kid was messing him about. He wanted more money and this and that. So then he phoned me back and he's going, do you want this fight? I said, who is it? He said, the kid's name. I've never really heard of him. I said, yeah, go on then. He said, get yourself to Dudley. I said, what time ago? He said, you got to be there for seven o'clock for the way I done my dinner and everything, so so I'm going to be a bit heavy. He said, "Well, the kids a bit heavy anyway." So I got there, and it was Rob Hunt. It was about six foot two. And I think he was about ten stone seven. Well, there's me. I had my dinner and that away, and I think I was nine twelve. <laughs> the fight was a piece of piss, you know what I mean? It was an easy fight. And another time, I've been watching Coronado Street in the house when I used well when I used to live in my flat, and um, uh, it always bibbed out. So I looked out the window. So I used to always have my kit ready, you see. And uh, Nobby's gone. There's a fight going. I said, when? He said, now, come on, we're going to London. So that was about seven o'clock, about half seven on the night. Drove to the, I think, uh, some hotel in London. I boxed uh, Marlon Ward, I think it was, who was IBA champion. Easy fight. But I've had numerous fights like where he's just phoned me up and he said, I'm on my way to pick you up, there's a fight going. I never said no to a fight. I didn't know how to say no. Do you know what I mean? 
So, what, what, see, when you were fighting, I, I want to go into some of the names that you have fought, but when, when, when you went into these fights and that, what, what, what made you so difficult to, for these, like you mentioned you fought world champions, British champions, European champions, but you, you would never stop. I mean, you would stop maybe 10 times in your 270, yeah. whatever losses it was, but like, what, what, what did you do to, to, to learn that sort of defensive side of your of, of, of your game? Because a lot, of, like you said, you weren't stopped, you only stopped 10 times, I believe. So, like, yeah. were you a defensive genius? <laughs> I know people used to say, oh, you're tough. I weren't tough, I was clever. Do you know what I mean? It's like anyone could stand and get punched in the head, do you know what I mean? But mm. I used to slip shots, I used to know how to tie people. An eight three minute fight, you, you fight for a minute of the round, you might fight for a minute, then you have a little walk round. Then you back them up, then you hold them, you hit them in the bollocks. You, you know, you, you do what you do to get through. But I was, I never panicked, you see. I was very, always very calm. Like outside the ring, I was hot headed, but inside the ring, I was really super calm. I, I never let, let nothing phase me, do you know what I mean? And I think that st stood me in good stead because I was always fit anyway. I was, you know, I was always fit. I mean, I've done a 10 round for a, a day's notice, you know, I've done that twice. And uh, I, I was always capable of going the distance. and Look, so I've been in with some big punches and anyone could take a shot. It's like, I used to ride shots just by the movement of my shoulder, just, just a slip air, and block my hands here, block shots. And look, so I just tread on the foot and I just knew how to mess them about. But I never let them walk all over me. And I could bang a little bit, do you know what I mean? So if they thought they were coming in and just walking straight through me, it wasn't happening because I shook a few people up, you know what I mean? A few people said to me after I boxed them, God, you could bang a bit, you could. And like, you surprised, you know, I think there was surprise because a lot of journeymen haven't got a lot of KOs. I mean, I thought I had eight, but I put a lot of people on the floor from my career. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the legends that you have fought because 300 professional fights, you would have fought some very, very talented fighters. Prince Nassim, for one, Duke McKenzie. Then you can go even one of my countrymen, Scott Harrison, who's a, who's a scary man up here. Yeah. They're very, very hard hit. Yeah. Lee Selby for people that maybe can't go that far back, and even Kel Brook, they're all world champions and stuff like that. So, like when you when you look at your career and you look at these names that you've you have fought, two quick parts of this question: How proud are you of that? And who's the toughest and maybe the hardest puncher and whatever that you that you fought leading up to them? Yeah, yeah, I'm well proud of them. When I look at the names on the record, I, I think God, they've gone out to achieve so much. You know what I mean? Mm. Best boxer I box, I always say that day, Duke McKenzie went on to win three world titles, right? Yeah. Biggest puncher, less so freighters, without a doubt. Not that he hit me clean, clean in the on the chin, but he was that strong. I mean, Scott Harrison was strong, really strong. Scott was like, Scott was like, trying to push a house back, you know what I mean? But a fr freighters, he was just on the look. So I always say to everyone, when I box freighters, I hadn't even saw him. I hadn't heard of him, and I'm quite good at my boxing, you know. Like, I used to know all the fighters and that. But I'd never heard of him. And when he got in the ring, because I had the tournament the way, and I took the fight with a notice, he actually was walking to the ring, and I said to my manager, is that him? And he went, yeah, I went, he's big. And he went, yeah, he said, you'll be all right, son, you'll be all right. And then he got in the ring, and then read out his record, 18 fights, 18 wins, 18 knockouts. And I said to my manager, this is a nice one, and he went, you'll be all right, son. The first round, he hit me with a shot, and I swear, he was like fighting a middleweight. He was that strong. He didn't even have skinny legs. He had big legs. I mean, I was about nine two on the night. He was probably ten stone easy, right? Yeah. So I done three rounds with him, but and then my corner pulled me out, so I wasn't going to fit on my way for eight rounds with him. Yeah, because look, I was say fifty percent fit that night, but uh, he was just too strong and too big. And he even said, "Freitas in Ring Magazine, the most defensive boxer, best defensive boxer he's ever boxed with Peter Buckley." So for someone like that to say about me, that's that's just great, do you know what I mean? Definitely. And it's something that you can you can tell your kids, your grandkids and whatnot. But again, yeah. what what obviously you fought some of the legends that I've met I mentioned there next world champions, but what have they said to you? What what these guys that you mentioned Duke McKenzie and stuff like that and, and Scott Harris, but what have they said to you after the fight and stuff like that? Have anyone given you some words of advice or just how good you were or whatever? What's the best thing that's been said to you after a fight? Well, they have said to me, they said, like, mate, he was like, like trying to pin a fucking I know, on the other, they said, like, I was that elusive and that, do you know what I mean? Like, and they said my defence was like, they just said, like, we couldn't break you down, like, do you know what I mean? I mean, Scott, I mean, Scott was really strong, but he couldn't break me down. I mean, I've got a four-rounder fight. I boxed him twice, you say. Yeah. And uh, 
I'm slipping the shots. I'm doing all right with him. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he was early in his career, but I, I knew he was going places because he was very correct, Scott, and very physically strong for his weight. Do you know what I mean? But oh, it's not with a box, Carl Brook. Carl Brook was massive when I was compared to me. But even he said to me after, I, I couldn't hit you clean on the chin. It's like, looks like people used to say, oh, Peter Buckley is tough. I, was, I wasn't just tough. I was clever. Do you know what I mean? Because any, anyone could be tough. Do you know what I mean? Anyone could stand on the ropes, take a hiding. But I wanted more than that. If I came out before with a black eye, I'd done my head in, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd like to come out on the sky, do you know what I mean? And that was like, looks like I had good sparring, but look, in my gym, I had some real good fighters. I had Paul Wesley when I fought the British title, the Ramsey brothers, who was excellent amateurs, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And Brian Coleman, who had 100 plus fights as well. We all learnt off each other in the gym, you know. We, they didn't all learn off me, all learnt off them. We all, we all learnt off each other, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was all good fighters and fought good lads. You mentioned that, that- you, you would do your head and if you got out of a fight with a black eye and stuff like that. So did you pride yourself leaving a fight unscathed? Oh, 100 percent yeah. I, I, never, I didn't want to come home and my daughter seen me with a, a black eye when she was a kid and that, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I wanted to come home, not a mark on me, really, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, a pocket full of winner. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like you you've uh, but some people say like for, for journeymen they fight every other week and it's probably the best way to make money. Did, was does that was that what you saw? You just saw this as a job or a hobby. How did you how did you see it? Well, it, it wasn't when I first started. It, it, I didn't class it as a job. I just thought I'd earn a few quid here, stay out of trouble, blah blah. But it did become a, a way of earning money without me getting in trouble. And all. it's a, it's a hard way to earn money. Believe me, I mean you get every week in week out, and it, it's hard. It's a hard, you know, especially if you've been on the piss the night before, which I you know I used to go out and have a drink. And uh, I'll get a phone call and they'll be like, I mean, I was, I'll come off holiday once. I've been on holiday for two weeks. I've been drinking every day. But I used to go for a little run and that on holiday. And I'll come back once on the Friday night. And nobody's gone to me. How's your holiday? I've done all right. Do you drink much? Yeah, yeah. Do you eat much? Yeah, yeah. There's a fight going tomorrow. Who against? I'd say, so I'll say, say how much? I'll say how much? So I'll, say, I'll say, yeah, yeah, I'll be okay. And I'd go and fight him. And that was my job, basically. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, but listen, like I said, you, you've sort of got a little bit of a legend status in, in British boxing with the way that you fought and the 300 professional fights and stuff like that. And there was, there was talks about a film and stuff like that of, of your career and your life and there's a book being written. Is that is that still going ahead? And... Yeah, my, my book's out the 21st of June, yep. called King of, yep, King of the Journeyman. And King of the Journeyman. Yeah. But there was, um, when I first packed it, about, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago, um, someone got in touch with me on Facebook saying like, they'd like to make a film. I mean, I was like, yeah, okay. But then... It was uh, George Tillman Jr. who done um, quite a lot of films, you know. He was big in America. Mm. So we got on the phone, was chatting, blah, blah. And he said, I'm going to get some writers to speak to you. So I was doing conference calls with these writers and that. The written script for me and that, I sent it over. I didn't really like it that much. It was too Americanized. It wasn't really me. Yeah. And I told them this and that. They said, yeah, but, you know, films ain't 100% accurate. I said, yeah, I understand that. I said, but this is a bit too far off the mark. So they've done another script already. And then there was getting investors, but it, it just went on for a few years. And then they the sent me another contract. I said, look, can you get it, give it another two years? Because these things take time. And in the end, it just it went on for a few years. And it just faded out in the end, you know what I mean? And the, the funding weren't there. I mean, there was talking st- stupid money. Like, we need 20. They was talking about 20 million. Like, it was 20 pence. Are oh, we going to raise 20 million to get this film? And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And after a few years, it faded out. But like I say, um, then I got approached to do books and this and that. And look, a few, look, that book, Journeyman with Mark Turley, he approached me to do that book. And I was like, I don't really want to do it. Like, I was telling if I'm going to do a book, I'll do it about myself. I don't, you know, I don't want a chapter in the book. I've got more, more to speak than that. So then Chris Ackers got in touch and, yeah, we got in touch with each other. And we used to meet up, have a chat, and blah, blah, blah. And we just started writing the book. and. Uh, it's all done now, and it's out the 21st of June. Well, I'm looking forward. To, I'm definitely going to buy the book, and Peter, if you can sign one for me, if I can send one down to yeah, you. Yeah, of course, book. yeah, no problem. Again, 300 professional fights. Which was your toughest? Was it Duke McKenzie? Oh, without a doubt. Clock side. When the box Duke McKenzie, I honestly went down there, like, crazy as it sounds now, naive, thinking I had a chance. I thought, when I was offered the fight, I jumped to it, you say. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't, I didn't have a journeyman mentality then, do you know what I mean? Yeah. After I boxed Duke McKenzie, I was, I was devastated when I got stopped. I went five rounds and my manager said to me, listen, you took the fight for a day's notice. You went five rounds with a world champion, former world champion. 
don't be ashamed. So I, was, I was really disheartened. I thought, oh, that's in the me now. I'm never boxing again. That's how the loss hit me. Like, oh. so I've never been stopped amateur or pro ever. But, you know, I've been pro ever, but only once by then. And uh, I was devastated. And not, not be putting perspective, he said to me, look, you boxed a, a, a man who's, and he went on to win another three world titles. So after that, like, I used to go to fights. I wasn't, I wasn't like, always, but I realised a bit more about the game then. I knew I was not that. I never thought I was at like, world level anyway, but boxing European champions after that and up and coming like, Commonwealth game medalists like Spencer Oliver and people are, I don't know, okay, with them. And looks like I fought for a WBI Intercontinental in Austria against uh, Harold Gear, who was unbeaten in about 16, 17 fights. And I had like eight weeks of training. Well, eight weeks for me was like a lot of time. And that's be eight stone, eight stone ten for the fight. I was actually when I weighed it, I was eight stone seven. I was like, my missus was like, you look like a, you know, you like you starved yourself. But I was that fit, I was doing 10 mile runs. I was and it was like national anthems and works over there. And in the ninth round, I actually put him over. And the referee, I wouldn't say give him a long count, but he basically took him back to his corner, wiped his gloves, like, oh, oh, what's going on here? And I actually beat him up for the next three rounds. And he got the decision. But he fought for the world title after that. And he got knocked out in 17 seconds. He was one of the quickest knockouts he got beat. And I thought, man, if I would have fought that Mexican, I'm not saying I would have beat him, no chance, but I wouldn't have got knocked out like that, do you know what I mean? And I thought Johnny Bredel, who I fought, he, you know, he was a good kid. He went on to win some world titles. There's a lot of, lot of lads who are boxed who went on to win world titles, you know. And I, I was never disgraced in there with any of them, do you know what I mean? Definitely. But what... Obviously, we've got some good journeymen nowadays and stuff like that that are probably well known in the, in the, on the circuit and stuff. But what, what kind of advice do you give to, to to guys that are coming through and have got that journeyman tag and that that they've been tagged as a journeyman? They've only had 20, 30 fights or whatever. But what kind of advice could you give them? Well, what they've got to try and do, they've got to try and earn as much money as they can without getting hurt because they're always in their way. Listen, you're always you're always too. No matter what journeyman you are, you're two rounds. Two rounds down, straight away before the fight. I mean, I've been up to Scotland numerous times over the years when I was boxing. And you can go up there, you can try your eye out, right, and lose by a point. Or you can go up there and treat it as a spa. And you're still getting the same money, win, lose, or draw. So sometimes it's a case that you, these journeymen don't try and have a fight every every fight, you know, because you're still going to get paid the same amount of money. And you're probably still going to lose. I mean, out of 100 more losses, I guarantee some of them have been more by a point or half a point. I mean, I had 12 draws in my career. That is 12 wins because I was all away, away for it. But none of them was my own team. Do you know what I mean? So you've, you've got to be thick skinned because when you, these journeymen, I mean, I saw a journeyman on the telly, like, like Chris Adderway, where he was there. I thought he deserved a draw a few weeks ago. He lost every round by the record. I'm thinking it's really, it can be disheartening. Yeah. Like, so you got to be thick, you got to be thick skinned and just think, so like, I never used to give the referees loads of stick after the fight. Not be, not be used to it. But I never, because I used to think, there's no point me slagging them up, because they'd probably be refereeing me next week. And to be honest, I got on with most of the referees, even if they, they didn't give me a decision when I fought I won. I thought, yeah, you know, there's no point slagging, because one, it ain't going to change the decision. Two, I'm going to be seeing them next week. So, you know. But I've had some referees say to me back in the day, like Mickey Van, I remember I boxed Sean Hughes down his, down his area, and I dropped him. And even Sean said he was proper shocked to see that he didn't think I could bang like that. And then Mickey Van, as I've come out for the last round, Mickey Van's gone to me, good last round here, son, you'll get a draw. To me, look, quietly, good last round here, you'll get a draw. They'll come out, another good last round, and I've got a draw. But I won that fight, really, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know. Well, well, finally, obviously, I mean, I'm, it's fascinating your career. I'm going to get this book of, of yours because I'm, I'm intrigued by it. But the King of the Journeyman, uh, it's not a bad nickname, is it? You, you proud of that nickname? No. I am, well, you know who come up with it. I've done a, a podcast with Matt, Matthew Macklin about six months ago. And Matthew said to me, you know, because you are the king of the journeyman, Pete. And I went, yeah, he went, yeah, you are. He said, you're the king of the journeyman, you are. And I thought, God, what a great sort of. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, you're back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Matthew Macklin actually said to me, he went, uh, yeah, king of the journeyman. And I thought, that'd be a great name for a book. So, when me and Chris was talking about the book, he actually said to me, that was a great name, Macklin, King of the Journeyman. He said, do you think that'd be a good name for the book? I said, it'd be a great name for the book. I was thinking, I was the King of the Journeyman. Do you know what I mean? Definitely, mate. Well, Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you on this lovely Sunday afternoon. Um, you got yeah. any, one final word you would like to, 
to say on this interview? Like maybe go out and buy this book when it's out. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely go out and buy the book because I, I think it's a, a good story. Like I say, it's the start of it's about my life growing up. Like I, say, I was the youngest of nine kids. You know what I mean? I was the bad my mum's baby. And I had five older sisters and three old, older brothers. And like I say, my dad died when I was young and it was hard, but like I got there in the end, you know what I mean? I, I come through a bad patch. And boxing, like I say, like, it did really save my life, do you know what I mean? Because I'd hate to think where I'd be now if it didn't come along, do you know what I mean? Definitely. Well, Peter Buckley, King of the Germany, man. The book is out June 21st, did you say? Yeah, June the 21st, yeah. Well, like I said to you, I'm going to buy one, I'm going to send it to you. I've, I've got your number, and I want. if you don't mind, just give me a wee, a wee signature, man. I'll be, I'll be That's amazing. That's not a problem, Andrew. That's Thanks. great. Cheers. Enjoy your Thank you. Sunday, and I'll give you a message when this is out. Thanks very much, Pete. Okay, cheers, mate. Take care. Thanks, nice